if you'll turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12 and find verse 33, read a short verse there that um, I'm sure is familiar to a lot of you. Jesus says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. The title of our message is Make the Tree Good. Uh, I can think you can tell by the, the, met, the title that I am kind of leaning towards that good part. <clears throat> Jesus did give a command here that uh, you might say consist, uh, consists of two parts or maybe even four parts. Uh, first of all, make the tree good and its fruit good. I guess that could be two commands. Or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. So depending on how you want to count commands, you could come up, count that four. I'm just counting it as one command. But you'll <clears throat> be quick to notice that there is both a positive command and a negative command in what Jesus says here. The positive command is to make the tree and its fruit good. The negative command is to make the tree and its fruit bad. We are accustomed to hearing exhortations to be good. But why would Jesus give an exhortation to be bad? Kind of makes you want to scratch your head. What are you up to, Jesus? Well, Jesus is not telling us to do bad things or that it is even permissible to do bad things. You see, Jesus gave his life on the cross to save us from sin and enable us to live holy lives. So Jesus doesn't want us to be bad or to do bad. He wants us to be good and do good. That's why he gave his life. What Jesus is saying is that it is morally and spiritually, there is no middle ground with God. You are either right with God or you are not. Make the tree good, make the truth bad. You're good or bad one way or the other. There is no middle ground. And the proof of that can be seen in the fruit of your life. The things that you do and say. This command was given by Jesus in response to an accusation by some Pharisees that Jesus had cast out a demon using the power of the devil. And Jesus points out a contradiction in their thinking. In verse 26, he says, If Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? He said, your, your accusation doesn't make sense. Satan is not going around casting out Satan. does not make sense. <laughs> then he turns their accusation against himself. In verse 27, he says, If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? In other words, in simpler terms, you can't have it both ways. Satan does not cast out Satan. Your own people cast out demons. I cast out demons. Therefore, I am not casting them out by the power of Satan. By implication, he also suggests that if he cast out Satan or demons by the power of Satan, then it is possible that the Jews also cast out demons by the power of Satan. And the Jews were not willing to accept this accusation. In verse 25, he says, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Brother, that is true. And what he's saying here is, 
You have to make a choice. I'm presenting you with a choice. Their talk and their actions did not line up. There is a glaring contradiction in the lives of these Pharisees. They're criticizing Jesus for the very same thing that they profess to do. And their words just don't line up. You see, the Jews here profess to be a good tree, but their fruit is inconsistent with that profession of being a good tree. The truth that Jesus applies here is the same truth which he applies in Mark chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, where he says, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. He's teaching that the fruit of your life, your behavior, what you do, comes from your heart. Comes from your heart. And he's letting us know that the heart of the unregenerate is wicked. This word heart is used to mean the seat of the spiritual nature, or that which prompts the will, that which determines what we actually do. And because people come into this world as sinners, their hearts are sinful, and they bear the fruit of sin in people's behavior. Well, it is possible for sinners to do some things that are good, the evil tree of the heart overpowers that good with its bad fruit. You know, we have to understand that. Um, you know, people get the idea we talk about sinners as people who are just only always doing bad things. You realize that most sinners do good things, but the problem is their heart is an evil heart. It's a fallen heart. And it overpowers that good to where that good really doesn't count for anything as far as their soul is concerned, as far as uh, their relationship with God because there's sin that comes out of that heart. And that sin cancels out the good. You see, it's the same thing as trying to sell a bag of, a bag of rotting apples. Who here would buy a bag of rotting apples. Just raise your hand. Uh, people are shaking their heads. Why wouldn't you buy rotting apples? Well, because you want good apples. You want fresh apples, whole apples. Now, you could tell the buyer to just cut out the rotten parts. You see, the rest of it's good. Now, I got this apple, it's rotting. Just cut out the rotten part. And here, you know, you, you do that to all these apples. There's some good in there. Oh, that could be true. But you will never convince the buyer that the apples are not rotten. They're just something that spoils the whole fruit. The truth is that people without the grace of salvation are rotten to the core. And all the fruit of their lives is spoiled, even though there might be some good spots here and there. Now in our lesson back in the book of Matthew, Jesus is saying essentially the same thing in verse 34 and 35. He says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. Amen. Now, maybe you picked up on this. I didn't really pick up on it until I studied for the message. 
But Jesus makes a direct connection between the heart and the mouth, the things that people say. This suggests to me that more sin is committed with the mouth than in any other way. Amen. Jesus says, make the tree and its fruit good or bad. And then he goes on to say a lot of things about people talking and what they talk about. Which reminded me of what the, uh, the, uh, the, the James wrote in chapter 3, verses 5 through 12. You remember James, the brother of the Lord Jesus? He, he really gets pointed. Really gets hard on this idea of, of our talking. He says in verse 5, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest the little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. Wow, that's a pretty hard statement about people in their mouths. Hell? Evil? Wow. For every kind of beast and bird, a reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. Listen to his exhortation here. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. You can't have it both ways. Make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. You have a decision to make. You have to make a stand. You have to decide which way it's going to be in your life. Now, Adam Clark had some insight into what James wrote here, some clarification. But the tongue no man tames. He makes this comment. There's no cunning, no persuasion or influence that has ever been able to silence it. Nothing but the grace of God, excision or death, can bring it under subjection. That's a pretty powerful statement. The tongue, the way we talk, you just can't silence it, you just can't control it, except by one of three possible things. The first one and the best one is the grace of God. Thank God the grace of God can change our heart, can change our tongue, the way we talk. He says if you don't go that way, then excision. That means to cut it out. <laughs> That's not a very pleasant way to deal with the tongue. And the third way is for you to drop dead. And that's not a very good way. So. You see the mouth, the tongue, the way people talk is pretty much an indication of who they are. And you just can't change who you are, what you do, what you talk about without a change in heart. He says it's an unruly evil, an evil that cannot be restrained. It cannot be brought under any kind of government. It breaks all bounds. Did you hear what Jesus said about the heart? All that stuff that is in there, murders and adulteries and evil thoughts and, and all these things. And the sinner 
can't stop those things from coming out. Now the sinner may not do every one of those things, but he's going to do at least one of them, if not several of them. See, there's not too much you can control about sin. See, sin controls you. It's true. And sin is always going to drive you to do the wrong thing at the wrong time. You know, sinners kind of get this idea that they can tell a lie. They can use foul language. They can do something wrong. And they're going to get away with it. Well, everybody else does it. But they think they're shrewd enough not to get caught, not to be found out. Or they just don't care. But you know, sin has its payday. Sin has its consequence, has its result. And you can't stop the power of sin. And let me tell you, friends, one place where you cannot stop the power of sin is in your mouth. I said I think people probably sin more with their mouth than with anything. People talk, people blurt out things, people say things that ought not to be said. If not to other people, to themselves. You can't control what comes out of that mouth. He says, on one side, we bless God. Clark says, it can proclaim and vindicate the truth of God and publish the gospel of peace and goodwill among men. We can do that with the mouth. Thank God for that. We can teach, we can preach, we can go around inviting people to church, we can share our testimony. Those are good things. Then he goes on and said, what a pity that it should ever be employed in falsehoods. Calumny, calumny, that's a hard word for me to pronounce, telling lies, or in the case of infidelity. You know, we have a mouth that we can praise God with. But yet, people use it to curse other people, to tell lies, to use it foully and wrongly. So he says on one side, we bless God, and on the other side, we curse men. In the true satanic spirit, many pray to God the Father to destroy those who are objects of their displeasure. The consideration that man is made after the image of God should restrain the tongue of the swearer. But there are many who, while they pretend to sing the high praises of God, are ready to wish the direst implications either on those who offend them or with whom they choose to be offended. I kind of like the way Clark put that. Those who offend them or they choose to be offended by. You know, we... We stab people in the back with our tongues. We gossip with our tongues. We curse men with our tongues. You know, I, I've seen people who get hurt or offended or take offense by what somebody's done, and they will go out and they'll run their mouth. And they'll say all kinds of things about that person. Things that aren't true. Or they'll take things and they'll twist them so that they're made to look bad. And Clark says, why do we do that? Because those same people have been made in the image of God. When you curse another human being, when you lie against another human being, when you gossip and answer against another human being, you're actually doing all that against God. Say, well, that creep. I can't say that that creep is, is the same as cursing God. Now, maybe you can't say that, but God does. We have no right to curse any other human being. We have no right to spread rumors and gossip about another human being. And listen, when we talk about other people, we need to be careful what we say, even if it's true. What's the motive behind what we're saying? Why are we saying that, even if it is true? Mm -hmm. See, there's a motive which goes down again 
to that heart, to the tree. In verse 13, James asks the question, who is a wise man? Who is a wise man when it comes to this tongue, to this mouth? And Clark says, only true religious, uh, <clears throat> excuse, one truly religious, who, although he can neither bridle nor tame other men's tongues, can restrain his own. Let him, by a holy life and chaste conversation, show through meekness and gentleness joined to his divine information that he is a Christian indeed. His works and his spirit proving that God is in him of a truth, the fruit, and that from the fullness of a holy heart, the tree, his feet walk, his hands work, and his tongue speaks. In verse James, uh, 10, James says, My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Albert Barnes comments, They are as incongruous as it would be for the same fountain to send forth both salt water and fresh, or for the same tree to bear different kinds of fruit. There's no middle ground. One or the other. Jesus says, you know who you are, really. Be what you are. Okay? You see, the tree can't help bear the fruit of its kind. What fruit is your tree bearing? What comes up from your heart? and out of your mouth. That's who you really are. That's who you really are. The command to make the tree good or bad is given to religious people. Well, we really like to put all this on the sinners, don't we? You know, they're the bad people out there. Have you ever noticed that in the Gospels, Jesus seems to be doing more preaching to religious people than to out-and-out -out sinners. Oh yeah, he talks to sinners about their needs. But you know what his talk to them is? Come. Come. You who are heavy laden. You who are burdened. I will give you rest. But when he talks to religious people, he seems to be quite stern. And there's a reason why. You see, the sinner isn't representing God. The religious person is representing God. And when religious people act like sinners, it sends the wrong message to the sinners. You know, when a, a sinner looks at a sinning Christians, and they say, well, my life is no different than that sinning Christian. In fact, there's some ways in which my life is better than that sinning Christian. Why do I need to be a Christian if my life is better? And you see, they miss the point of the gospel because someone is misrepresenting the gospel. So Jesus deals a lot with religious people because it was a problem in his time and it's preserved for us in the gospels because Jesus knew that going forward into the life of the church, through the history of the church period, that we would have this problem as well as the old-time Jews had a problem. You see, hypocrisy is not relegated to one religion. Hypocrisy is not relegated to one race of people. It seems to be a disease of religious people. So it seems that we tend to have a greater problem with this tongue business than other people because we should have a grace to control it, to deal with it. We profess to be holy people, the tree. 
about what comes out of our lives, what comes out of our mouths. It had better be consistent with our profession. The way you live, the way you talk, must be consistent with your profession. Like the Jews of old, it seems to be an easy thing for professing Christians to lapse into old habits or to engage in some secret sins. Just think that, well, they don't count if no one sees them or if no one takes them seriously. You might be surprised how many people professing to be Christians think that way. It's just a little sin. It doesn't count. Oh, I, I said that, I did that. Nobody saw me. Oh, well, God saw you. The Holy Spirit saw you. He's right there. He heard every word you said, every word you thought. It is too easy to rationalize falsely that the fruit might have some rotten spots, but the tree really is good. Not so according to Jesus. But I think too many Christians, they think that way. I'm a good tree, but some of my fruit's got rotten spots on it. Doesn't work that way. Not according to Jesus. You don't get to choose your fruit. You get to choose your tree. Think about that. You might, might want to write that down. You don't get to choose your fruit. But you do get to choose your tree. In Psalm 51, verse 10, the psalmist says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. You see, the solution, the cure to that heart condition is not just try to do better, but for God to create a clean heart and renew a right spirit. Only God can change the, the inside. Only God can change the tree. Amen. God wants for people to live right lives. And that is why He sent the Lord Jesus Christ into the world to make atonement for sin. He wants good trees and good fruit. The atonement makes it possible for God to remove that evil heart. Amen. That evil heart Jesus talked about in the Gospel of Mark. And to create a new heart. To pull out that old, dead, horrible tree and create a new living tree. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the Word of God says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Create in me a new heart, a clean heart. If you are in Christ, the Word of God says you are a new creation. You're not that old sinful tree. You are a holy and righteous tree. Old things have passed away. Behold, a couple of things are new. All things. Oh. What was that? All things. All things are new. I'm glad you're listening. Keep me straight. There would be some people out there that would teach that only a few things are new. You, you have a lot of old things hanging around. But the Word of God says, the old things pass away, create in me a clean heart, and renew a right spirit. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. How many is all? How many is all? I want to ask you, when you got saved, when you joined a church, when you took on a profession, when you decided to be religious, I'm throwing out a lot of things here. Did all things become new? Or did you just add church to what you do? Did you add religion to how you think and you still have some of those old things going on in your life? That's like having all those rotten spots on the bag of apples. 
There might be a little bit of good stuff there, but the rotten spoils the whole thing. Lord Jesus did not die just to give you a few clean spots on your rotten house. He died to root up that old tree and give you a new tree that puts forth godly fruit. It is a difficult thing for religious people to admit that they have never been saved or that they have actually fallen away from God. They have a profession, but they just don't stop to look at their fruit. Sad, sad, sad. It is a sad thing that bad trees think that no one else can see that their fruit is bad. Have you ever been near an apple tree that's full of rotten fruit? The tree thinks that is doing such a good job of producing fruit. Look at me. I am an apple tree. I have apples. But the apples are rotten. And the stench is so strong that people won't go near it. The hypocrite is the last person to become aware that everyone else knows he is a hypocrite. You see, he does not smell the stench of his own bad fruit. In conclusion, the truth that Jesus points out to us is you cannot have it both ways. Fruit, you see, is a heart condition. And do not say that you are right with God if your behavior or your speech says otherwise. Amen.